All right, Ezra chapter 2 tonight. And I'm going to take us to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your goodness and all the blessings you bestowed upon us. I pray that you will just speak to us tonight through your word. I know this is a, a unique chapter that we're going to dive into, uh, a lot of different names. And thank you that um, even though my name may not mean much here uh, to, to people that would see it in a, a newspaper or an article, I'm glad it means something to you. And I trust that we'll all get that out of this message tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Ezra 2, and I'll read a select few verses on this tonight, but when people study and read the Bible, sometimes genealogies pose a little bit of a problem for them when they get to a section like we're at tonight, Ezra chapter 2. So the question is, what do you do when you come to Ezra chapter 2 or, or Nehemiah or some of these chronicles and things when you such and such begat such and such and, and you go to that kind of thing? If you're reading the Bible methodically and systematically, which I hope you are, uh, as you read the Bible in your quiet time and stuff during the week, how do you do? What do you do when you come to something like this? When people are doing their little study through the Bible, read, reading through the Bible, you know, it's some people like, like these sections because they can just skim over them real quick and you, you're not really having to digest anything. You're just hitting the names. Sometimes I hear people talk about doing the lucky dip method. Y'all ever heard of the lucky dip method? Well, they use that when they're reading Scripture. And so their, their devotion every day or their study each day, they just take the Bible and open it up and boom, I hit the verse. That's called the lucky dip method of reading Scripture. Open it up anywhere, take whatever. And that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but you, did, you just have to be careful when you're doing that in your daily reading because I read about one man who did that. He engaged in the lucky dip method. And uh, he did it every morning before he started his day. And he did it one morning and he opened it up. And he turned to Matthew 27, 5, and it says, And he went and hanged himself. Well, that didn't satisfy him. He didn't like that verse. So sometimes we hit scripture that we don't like. So he reflipped it open, and, and he, this time he got to Luke 10, 37. And it said, Go and do you likewise. Go and do thou likewise. So this time he's getting a little concerned. He's saying, God's speaking to me here. I don't, I don't know. So he does the third dip, and he hits John 13, 27. And he's more startled when he sees that it says that thou doest do quickly. That thou doest do quickly. So you got to be careful when you read the word of God. Don't just open up things and do this lucky dip method and say, well, that's what God's saying to me. Not necessarily. Don't uh, don't don't do that. But when you're reading the Bible and you come to a chapter like this, what do you do? Do you skip over it and go to Ezra three? Do you do you say oh, I'm going to slip to the Psalms? I'm going to do this and that. Why, you know, why is there only a list of names here? Um, and as much as we wish these chapters didn't have to be faced during our Bible reading, there's some importance to the people that are in these scriptures. You know, we look over and names we can't pronounce. I can't, I wouldn't even try to pronounce half of them because I would mess it up terribly. Uh, but they are important people, not necessarily of uh, significant historical importance, maybe that we would see or that a historian would find. But they're important to God because they're in the Bible. And they have a, the Holy Spirit would have never moved Ezra to write about it if it wasn't some significance to it. And let me just remind you what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture, not just uh, pertinent Scripture that don't have names, he said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. So this list, which then also, I might add, can be found in Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 6 through 68, uh, it teaches us that the returning exiles were the legitimate descendants of the Jews who occupied Israel prior to their deportation to Babylon. I went through that little historical, historical era this morning and told you about them going to Babylon and the captivity. And the history of the Bible is redemptive history. And such lists are meant to demonstrate how God preserved his chosen people in the promised line of the Messiah from generation to generation. That's where I like to tune into it at right there is getting it in line with the Messiah to prove he is who he said he is through scripture. So I want to just talk about the background of this passage for a moment. I'm not going to go through all the history I went through this morning, but just remember that the Babylonian captivity now has come to an end. Um, God spoke to the heart of that heathen king. I talked about this morning, Cyrus, king of Persia. He issued a decree. He told them all they could go back. He told Israelites they could go back to their land. They didn't have to, but he, he told them they could. And um, the deportation, when they started coming back to the land, they did so in three 
uh, stages. So the first stage in 538 B.C. was the first remnant that came with Zerubbabel. He came with the group. Then in 458 B.C., a second remnant returned under Ezra, the priest. And then, as I discussed this morning, in 445 B.C., a third group came with Nehemiah, the layman. And uh, so that's how it went, uh, with Nehemiah, the layman. So there were two exoduses in Israel's history. The first exodus was from Egyptian captivity. You read about that in the Exodus, the book of Exodus 13 through 15. And the second exodus was what we're talking about now, the Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah 25 talks about that. So in this text tonight, we're going to see where the Israelites are going home to broken walls. You know, the temples destroyed. Everything is desolate in their town. I mean, just think about it. everything has been destroyed by the heathen king and, and things like that. So they're having to start again, start all over again. And uh, but for these 70 years, they've been in captivity. They've been together and they've been united. So I want to look at some of these lessons that we can learn out of this 70 year of captivity, this return from the exile. And I want to preach on the thought of just a list of names, just a list of names is the title of my message. And again, it may just be, appear to be a bunch of names to us that don't mean anything. But this passage gives us far more a mere lesson and far more than just a mere pronunciation of names. Uh, it teaches us lessons about the faithfulness of God and his people. So I want you to tune, hone, hone in on that as we go through it. So the first point I have is they were preserved by God. They were preserved by God. So the gift of the land and the preservation of Israel as a, as a distinct nation were tied in with God's plan to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the savior of the world. Now, Israel is a remarkable nation. It's God's covenant people. And throughout the history of Israel, an inevitable hand has been on them. You can't deny the hand of God has been on that little nation of Israel. Um, they should have been wiped out many times before. They've had great uh, armies come against them who should have been able to annihilate them. And it hasn't happened because God's hand is on Israel. They're indestructible people. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 through 37 talks about that. They are indestructible people. Even in exile, the nation of Israel was preserved by God. Now, remember, he chastised that they were in there for uh, being chastised. He, he, he whooped them for 70 years. That's what they were there for. And uh, but he kept them together and notice the means that God used to maintain the unity of the people of Israel. One way he did that was through faithful preaching. And you can study that through the prophet of Ezekiel. He ministered during the exile and his name, Ezekiel, the name Ezekiel means strengthened by God. And that's what he was. He was a prophetic. He had a prophetic ministry of God during this uh, exile. And Ezekiel three, eight, nine says, behold, I have made. Thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead against strong against their foreheads as an adamant harder than flint. I have made thy forehead fear them not, neither be dismayed at their idol, at their looks, though they may be a rebellious house. So Ezekiel and his wife were among the uh, 10,000 Jews taken captive to Babylon in 597 B.C. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 24. And for the first six years of his ministry, he preached to the exiles. He preached to his people. He was that's what, you know, God, regardless of the situation, God always put somebody there to give his voice, to make his word known to him. And that's what he did. So um, uh, faithful preaching preserves the people of God. You say preaching, why, you know, why preaching? Why would he preach nowadays? Things have changed. We don't need preaching. Uh, why is there such a strong emphasis on preaching? Because in these weird, wild and wicked times, uh, you know, Preachers are being rethought. Pre preaching itself is being rethought, revamped, re, um, re-examined. And the preachers have been pushed from the platform in favor of celebrity experts, entertainers, uh, little dramas and things like that. They want to take away the preaching, add more things to it that appeals to the flesh and not the preaching. And in an effort to appeal to people's interests, the church today emphasizes a great many different programs, methods, and approaches. Again, I'm not saying they're all wrong. I'm just saying preaching is necessary. So small group activities, worship services, where music, uh, music dramas and things like that sometimes gets put on top. Preaching's on the low platform. You know, you want to divvy your time up to where the dramas and the songs and stuff get more time and the preaching just kind of limited there. That's how a lot of things are. Musical evenings and gospel concerts. Seminars on everything on how to have a good marriage, how to run your finances, things like that. Now, again, I'm not saying all these things are harmful or wrong, but sometimes they need to be prioritized. They need to be in the right place. But 
what has been sacrificed in the flurry of activities is preaching. And the Bible still says, Romans 10, 14, how shall they hear without a preacher? So what kind of preaching do we need? We need the same kind we've always needed. We need a, uh, we, you know, we have a new kind of preacher in some churches who want to dilute the waters. They want to dilute the word of God. They want to add things to it. They want to take away from it. Uh, but the Bible says, 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, reprove rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That means the topics that we don't like to discuss. You know, you find people that's got family members that are living in a particular type of sin. And, you know, some preachers want to try to, try to avoid that. You know, I, I don't know all y'all situations, but I mean, if, if you've got a child or a grandson or a family member who's shacking up or a homosexual in homosexual sin or something like that or uh, whatever, name your sin, you know, if they're in that. I, I'm, I'm not going to avoid topics that if I'm preaching the Bible, I'm preach the Bible. I can't, don't be mad at me. Be mad at God. I can't. I can't tell you what's in the book. I can't dictate what what He says about it. That's this, that's what His Word says, and it's it's always true. It's been true since the um, beginning of time, and it'll always be true. His uh, His ideas don't uh, evolve. All right. So another means God uses to maintain the unity of His people is through family ties family togetherness. These genealogies here have been kept to provide proof of who were returning that were they were in fact the descendants of the original Jews who had gone into exile. And it goes back to where you need to prove your pedigree. You need to prove who you are, your genealogy, because hey, it was especially important because of the messianic uh, uh, me me messia messiahship, I guess you would say the messianic time of Christ. You had to be able to prove and, and Matthew and Luke this all correlates with them. Zerubbabel, uh, he's in there, and Luke, uh, Matthew, and Luke mentions him. Uh, but they, you know, if you were a priest, if you were a Levite, you had to prove you were a Levite or you wasn't a priest. If you couldn't prove it, if you couldn't prove through your genealogy who you were, then you weren't that. You were in the back of the line, and they they separated you. Um, and besides all this, was a strong emphasis on the Jewish family life, which is important today as it was then. It should be important to us. And so. I hope you see what God's doing here. He's using a Jewish family. Uh, he's using the Jewish family life to hold the Jews together. God was using the warmth of family life to preserve his people. Uh, you remember what God's law said in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. He says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And then in Deuteronomy 6, 7, uh, Moses uh, was charged God's people to uh, when he said, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest and when thou risest up. Now he's talking to Jews here. He's talking to God's uh, chosen people. But the application is still uh, very applicable to us today. We need to teach our How are the children going to learn? How are young people going to learn about God's word and things if we don't teach them? And that's an awesome responsibility, being a parent, a grandparent, a family member that, uh, you know, uh, it's not just a biological matter. You can't just say, well, I'm biologically his parent, so his or her parent. So that's that's not enough. Meeting their physical needs is not enough. We need to, and, and it's not just an emotional needs we need to meet. We need to meet their spiritual needs. We are, um, being a parent is a spiritual matter, and you need to meet that spiritual need. Uh, the University of Chicago did a survey of its graduate students asking them where they received the clearest teachings or impressions on religion and morality. The majority of those students answered they picked up the concepts of religion and morality from the mealtime conversations with their families. So your number one responsibility is to lead your children to accept Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, unfortunately, that's where the majority of these students are saying they're getting that that information, that that uh, knowledge, and I'm, you know, just, that's just purely lacking in America today or in the world today. So it's kind of scary if you think about it. Uh, think about Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years, and the people mocked him and said, you know, this crazy old Noah. He's building the boats, never rain, it ain't gonna rain. Uh, yet one day, when the rains of judgment began. Uh, all the rain started to fall and the Bible says Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives all entered into the ark safely, right? No person is a failure who can lead his or her family into the ark safely. Remember that. Uh, you know, so the question is, are we spreading God's teachings to our children and grandchildren? Uh, you know, I hear so many uh, preachers and, and people talk about uh, famous evangelists and, and 
uh, preachers of, of yesteryear and some of today where, you know, they, they're on the road so much spreading the gospel, preaching in churches, you know, seven days a week, it seems like. Yet their family gets left behind. Their, their children, they don't ever win their children to the Lord. So that should be our first priority um, to lead our children to the Lord. Another means he uses to maintain the unity of his people is through fearless men, fearless men and women. But uh, one of the men examples I give here is Daniel and his three friends. They were teenagers in 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and began his conquest of Judah. Think about the difficult days. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel. Think about all the, the uh, uh, tough times they went through in that time. They had a challenge. They were challenged by their, to their walk. The king sought to conform them to the ways of Babylon. Remember, he wanted to make them conform to their ways, their culture. There was a challenge to their witness. As the wise men of Babylon were able to tell the king his dream and delivered him unto death. So uh, their wisdom was challenged. And then their, uh, there was a challenge to their worship. As Nebuchadnezzar demanded all should bow and worship to his golden image. And then remember Darius. He command, his command stipulated that nobody was to pray to any god only to him. And in Daniel 3, we remember Daniel and his three friends were standing when everyone else was kneeling. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not kneeling. But remember the, the song, it wouldn't bend, it wouldn't bow, it wouldn't burn. And they didn't. And Daniel was kneeling when everybody else was standing. So what's the principle which governed their lives? The principle which, the principle which governed their lives in that time was in 1 Samuel 2.30, which says, Them that honor me, I will honor, saith the Lord. So that's an encouragement for all of us, but especially the younger folks. Uh, when you embark on life, uh, you know, hopefully I can encourage you to honor the Lord, obey the Lord, serve the Lord, uh, glorify the Lord, put him first in your life. Because look at this story here. If you read the book of Daniel, when he, he goes down into Babylon, he was a teenager. He lived about 86 years of age and ended the way he, his, his life ended the way it began. He entered he ended his life honoring the Lord. He didn't change. He stayed fast. He stood fast in his faith towards the Lord. So imagine the, the tower of strength he was to the people around him, to his peers and things like that, to see all those difficult days they had in exile. And he never wavered. His faith never wavered. His his, um, his the way he honored God never wavered. They must have thought, you know, old Daniel, he's still with us. He's still doing his thing. He's still he's still up there praying, even though they told him not to. These were fearless men who had an impact on the rank and file of God's people. We need that same kind of men and women today who will stand up for God. So they were preserved by God. The second point is they were precious to God. One theologian, Dr. Harry Ironside, said, many of the names are for us only names, but God has not forgotten one of the persons once called by these names on earth. Think of the pains the children of Israel took to keep strict record of their families while they were in captivity. And here God uses his servant Ezra under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to pen their names, to write down, to prescribe, to, to scribe these names down into scrolls. This indicates that our God is concerned with us as individuals. He respects the individuality of your, of your being. And their identity made them precious to God. They belong to God. The Israelites were a covenant people with an important God-given task to fulfill on earth, and they couldn't allow themselves to be corrupted. We read some here who were unsure of their family roots. Ezra, uh, in, uh, you read, uh, if you skip, scroll down through there, 59 through 63, uh, they were unsure of their family roots. So what happens is they're barred from the priesthood. That's what I was talking about, the Levites. They, if you couldn't prove your pedigree, you're no longer in the priesthood. So uh, these same people down in Babylon felt as though at times, I'm sure they had to have felt many times that God had forsaken them. God had forgotten about them. God didn't know who they were. Their prayers weren't getting answered. Their prayers weren't getting up. But Isaiah 49, 14 says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. And how often have we felt that way? How often have you um, had a trial cross your path or something, and you just think, God doesn't care about me? Because, again, maybe your prayers aren't being answered. or Maybe they're not being answered the way you want them to be. You think the Lord's uninterested in you. Um, maybe because he has not given you this blessing that you wanted and things like that. So at the same moment, you're saying, my Lord has forsaken me. Or God, did you forget I'm here? 
can you hear me? My prayers aren't getting up out of the roof. What's going on? God is saying through Isaiah and Isaiah 49, 16, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. I have engraven thee in the palms of my hand. So that tells us he don't forget us. He's not going to forget you. And uh, and then you can remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs on your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So he cares about you. He loves you. He knows you. You're engraving on the palm of his hand. Um, you may not be important. Like I said earlier, you know, you, you, you and I may not be important in the aspect of the, the people here out here in the world, but you're precious in the eyes of God. And regard and God, he regards you and I as jewels. And, you know, you always hear pa uh, parents say, oh, he or she's just a precious little jewel. What does that mean? Well, it means their little one's precious and deeply loved. That's how God looks on you. And especially if you're a child of his. Hey, if you're a child of God, he's your father. He loves you. He loves you so much. And first Peter two nine says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are on a straight path to hell until you came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight or you're watching this and you're saved through faith, um, he took you out of darkness into light. You can't say he don't think about you, that he don't love you, that he doesn't care about you. Uh, that's. Again, the, the best miracle you can experience. Then we see that their fidelity or their devotion made them precious to God. The total number who returned to Jerusalem seemed very small. And again, looking at the numbers and the ratios and things like that, uh, there wasn't a large group that came back from Babylon, but yet they constitute the remnant who in every age are faithful to God. And everywhere you go through the Bible, there's always a remnant. And Ezra, Ezra himself is one of the, uh, in his most moving prayer, speaks to the graciousness of God in permitting a remnant to return to their homeland. He prays in Ezra 9, 8. He says, and now for a little space, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and give us a nail in his holy place. So again, the doctrine of the remnant goes from Genesis to Revelation. There's a, God will always have a remnant. And... Do you, and if you'll recall the Lord's words to the church of Laodicea, you know, the lukewarm church in Revelation 3.20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door. So God calls for just one per he, he just just one person can respond to faith. That's all he's asking. One person to respond in faith. God starts with small things, a remnant, and we call them a faithful few, the remnant. Ezra lists them here for us in these verses. I'm not going to read them all, but as you scroll down those lists of names there in front of you there in Ezra chapter 2, in uh, verse 2, he's talking about their leaders. In verse 36, as you go down through there, he's talking about the priest. Verse 40 goes into the Levites. Verse 41 goes into the singers. These are all the, the uh, remnant who returned. The children of the porters, the, uh, in verse 43, he talks about the um, Nephinims. They were the servants and the children of Sol in verse 55. You see the children of Solomon's servants. They return. Every person named had a contribution to make to the effort of rebuilding the nation of Israel. Everybody had a purpose in their return. And again, as another statement from Harry Ironside says how highly God values all that is done from devotion of heart to himself and for the glory of his name. You know, we can't be doing things for the pat on the back. You know, people might give you the pat on the back, but ultimately we need to be doing it for God's honor and glory. And so there's a, uh, and let me just say this, you know, there's a remnant that's going to receive a crown of glory. There's uh, in glory one day, the crown of life for their faithfulness. So I want to be a part of that remnant there, that small group that is going to receive uh, that crown of life for the faithfulness that we show here on earth. So, uh, that's what we need to be working towards now, laying up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. So they were preserved by God. They were precious to God. And then thirdly, we see they were participating with God. They were participating with God. And it's it's a high privilege and honor to be a co-worker with the Lord. Uh, you know, I was talking about this morning about how, you know, we may not be doing certain things that other churches are. We're not on TV. We're not... Uh, um, 
on syndicated radio. We're not on these things right here. And we shouldn't put down those that are, the other churches are. We hear about things going on in other churches. Oh, well, we baptized one today. When they, oh, we, we baptized six. That shouldn't make you feel bad. That should, hey, we're not competitors. We're co-laborers, right? So they're building the kingdom of God. It's, uh, it's not, they're helping, you know, they're adding to uh, he's adding to it. They're just they're, they're just uh, being used by him. So we shouldn't let that discourage us. That should encourage us because God is still working today. So don't don't think that should be the discouragement. Paul speaks about being workers together with him in Second Corinthians six one. And these Jews here are participating with the Lord. How did they participate? One is they participated with their going. When Cyrus allowed them to return to Judah from Babylon, again he re- he allowed them. He didn't make them. He said, "Who is there among you?" Of all his people, let him go to Jerusalem. Let him go up to Jerusalem. He said that in Ezra 1 3. So he's, he's given them opportunity to go. Those who returned were, were a people who turned their backs on Babylon and set their faces toward Jerusalem. Uh, why so few? There was only 50,000, it's estimated. A tiny number only went back to Jerusalem in comparison to all those who had gone down to, to Babylon. So why so few? Well, compare that return in Ezra's day. To the situation in our world now. Remember, just in our history that we learn in schools today, in 1948, the modern state of Israel was established and immediately Jews began returning from all parts of the world, especially from the uh, United States and the UK. People started flocking back to Israel. And even so, the population of modern Israel is only about 8 million. Uh, and uh, the, the population they estimate of Jews living in other parts of the world, especially in the United States, is about 17 million. So why would only a short, a small few, a remnant return to Israel? Uh, some don't want to exchange their comfortable lives for the hardships and dangers of a war-torn Israel. Why would you want to leave New York City? You know, well, New York City, I'd leave New York City and probably go to a war-torn Israel. But, you know, why would you leave Danville, Virginia, to, if you were Jewish, to go back to uh, Israel and face missiles and rockets firing in at you all the time? Some people just don't want to do it. They're, they're comfortable here. They have the businesses. They have a good job. They're making good money. It was the same in Israel, in Ezra's day. Many had settled down in Babylon. Maybe they had intermarried with other people, which they weren't supposed to do, but maybe they had. Maybe they had created a new lifestyle for themselves. They had become prosperous over the years. And they had. You can read Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 7. It goes into all that. Not many were willing to leave their lives in Babylon to make that journey, that dangerous journey to a city of ruins. Well, I mean, think about it. you got all your belongings. You're going to travel on a road that's not safe. They had bandits and robbers and things like that that would come out to steal your stuff and try to kill you. To go to a place that's desolate, that's in rubble. Um, it, the temple no longer existed. God wasn't in the house. You know, the house of God didn't exist. It was destroyed. The cost was too great. They didn't want to leave their comfort zone. And an application for us today, many believers today are not so much at ease in Zion as they are content in Zion. Amos 6.1 says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. So question this to yourself, you know, am I too comfortable in my faith? Am I enjoying more of a laid back Christianity? You know, am I in my comfort zone? Do I want to stay in my comfort zone? Does the does our commitment to Jesus Christ make any real demands upon us involving personal cost and sacrifice? Does it make any demands when it comes to giving of our time, our energy, our money to the Lord's work? What about the cost of Matters like prayer for the ministry of the word for souls that are lost. There was a missionary who was watching the construction of a beautiful temple in a foreign country. And he asked a native lady standing right there. He says, how much is that temple going to cost right there? And she said, oh, it's for the gods. We don't ask what it will cost. So that's kind of how it was when David was setting the plans for what eventually turned out to be Solomon's temple. But it, you could say it was David's temple, but Solomon's temple there was no cost. To say, they, there was millions and millions of dollars. Well, billions in our currency today. But are, you know, what I'm asking you is, are you holding back your life because you're afraid of what it might cost? Hey, let's look at the way they participated. They participated with God in their giving. Uh, look at verse 68, Ezra 2, 68. It says, And some of the chiefs of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set up to set it up in his place. So you see what they did when they assembled on the side of the ruined temple. 
they gave freely. They gave, they, they gave. Although the temple was in ruins, the house still existed in the mind of God and was in the hearts of the people. They loved the temple and they wanted to give to the work of the Lord. Nehemiah tells us the tribal leaders in Zerubbabel, the governor, gave generously and the common people followed in their good example. He talks about that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 70 or something. Uh, they gave. They gave freely. Let's look at some of the ways they gave, how they gave to the Lord. Look at, um, in verse again, in verse 68, they gave willingly, they gave freely. Um, they didn't require a sermon on stewardship to persuade them into parting with their money. Our love of Christ can be measured by how much time and money we gave, how much time and money we give to the ministry. You know, one of my professors in college used to always say, you want to see where your heart is, pull your bank statement out, pull your credit card statement out and start looking. And that'll tell you how committed you are to God, where, where you're, uh, who you're serving or what you're doing, that kind of thing. Everybody's looking, looking down. Let me start, keep going here. They gave thoughtfully. They gave thoughtfully. Bible says... They gave after their ability. Look at verse 69. They gave after their ability. Hey, I told y'all I was going to preach in season, out of season. Might be topics you don't like, but we're going, to, we're going to talk about them. The Bible says they gave after their ability. They gave after their ability in verse 69 unto the treasure of the work three score and 1,000 drams of gold and 5,000 pounds of silver and 100 priest garments. The rich according to his riches and the poor according to his poverty. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. I ain't going to preach on tithing and all that, but I'm just pointing out some facts here in these verses. So my question to you for, for you to evaluate uh, your own life. Do you plan your giving in a systematic, thoughtful way in relation to the wages you earn? Is it a systematic approach or you just freely give or just give a certain amount, that kind of thing? And then thirdly, they gave cheerfully. And I always tell people this, if it hurts you, if, it's, if it makes you uncomfortable to pull that wallet out, to put anything in the offering plate, keep it in your pocket. You're better off leaving it in your pocket. Don't give it. Keep it in your pocket because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you, if you have any kind of apprehension about it, keep it in your pocket. They gave cheerfully. Uh, the Lord was their vision. And in the light of their vision of God, it, uh, vision, everything else paired paled in insignificance so his just like that that, in, that uh, native lady said it's for the gods we don't we, we don't care what it costs that's who these people were it's for god it's for jehovah we don't care what it costs we give cheerfully the bible says god loveth a cheerful giver second corinthians 9 7 these old testament saints put us to shame in relation to our giving you know when you study tithing, and people talk about tithing, you, know, you give 10%, the, old, the law was talking about 10%, and people say, oh, you know, you give 10%. Again, I'm not going to preach on tithing. You give what, you, you, that's between you and God. I, I, don't, I don't look at who gives what. I don't, I don't have any uh, access to that. But in the law, in the Old Testament, they gave different tithes. They didn't just give one tithe. They gave three different tithes. So study that and see what you think of that. They, uh, they could put some of us to shame, I, I'd say that. But giving to the Lord's work is not a fringe activity, but a spiritual obligation. If we acknowledge Christ as Savior and Lord, His Lordship extends to every part of our lives, including, including our giving. Now, that means not just all money. It's not, it's not just talking monetary. It's talking of giving your time, giving your efforts, and things like that. So, it includes our giving, including our tithes. Yet many, a Christian's wallet or purse is unconverted. Is this you? Is this me? We need to evaluate ourselves. Sure, you're saved, but your pockets are sewn up. The Lord Jesus observed what people were giving. Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44 talks about that. He knows what you give. And more importantly, he knows what you don't give. Amen. Amen. Is everybody awake still? Everybody's looking down. All right. All right, all right, I'm off that subject now. I'm not going to talk about it no more. We'll talk about sin or something. We'll, we'll talk about Jesus here. All right, so in conclusion, this is not just a, just a list of names, folks. Don't think about that. When you come upon these scripture, uh, these uh, passages of scripture, don't just look at them as just a list of names. Look at them that as a faith for these individuals here. These are a faithful remnant, and it speaks to us today and reminds us that we are preserved by God. We are precious to God and we are participating with God. 
This is the Lord's list. But you know, a much more important list that I want you to think about tonight, and I hope that those who are watching can look this up. We're told about a much more important list in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. And it says, And there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So much more important than being on any other remnant list or, you know, if you didn't make the cut in the Bible, you know, don't worry about it. Make sure your name's in the Lamb's book of life. That's what's important. That's what keeps you from the great white throne judgment. That's what keeps you from the judgment of God. That's what makes sure you're saved. And if you're not saved, he's there to save. He's in the saving business. We talked about that this morning. Thank God he is still in the saving business. He's saving people just like he did in great granddaddy's day. He's still saving them today the same way. Grace, uh, faith, through faith and his grace. And um, so if you are saved, is your name listed among the role of the faithful witnesses in the world today? If there was a list made by God today, is your name going to be on that list? We should do our best to live out the Lord's will and faithfulness until he calls us home. We should be working for him. We should not be in a comfort zone. We should get out there and witness to people. But I would challenge you to say this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, reach out to him today. He says, anyone, anybody, any person out there, I don't care about your history, your past, whatever is going on, or your present, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Confess your sins, turn to Jesus, he'll save you. Bow with us as we pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that you do uh, keep up with names and, and you don't forget us and you don't overlook us. That we may feel that way at off, oftentimes when things aren't going our way or we feel like we're overlooked in some form or fashion, but we know that you do um, think about us, you do care about us, and um, we just need to reflect on that knowing that our job is to evangelize the world, put the message of the gospel out there to the lost, and I pray that we'll continue to do that and be more challenged as we go out of here tonight. Lead God direct in the rest of the service. Pull that one that doesn't know you closer to you, dear Lord. Draw them near you. So they can uh, receive that saving grace, that saving, uh, um, that, that Savior that only you can provide. In Jesus' name, amen.